turn to Revelation chapter 11 as we continue in our series in the book of Revelation. We're going to camp out a little bit on chapter 11 because we have these two mysterious figures that we have to figure out who are they and what do they do, and they're called the two witnesses. The title of today's message is God's provision for our mission in life. We're going to derive our application from the two witnesses in terms of service. But to understand that you and I have been put in a period of time in history that very few Christians could even imagine could possibly happen. And there's been sermons given entitled, I never thought I'd see the day. And I thought, wow, that makes a lot of sense. I never thought I would see the day. Say that to yourself as far as what you have seen in your lifetime from when you were born to now, as far as morality is concerned in America, as far as the world dynamics going on, the push for a one world government, the push for a one world religion and and whatnot. Christians 50 years ago could have never said this. The technology advances to where we have a situation with artificial intelligence that if it continues to go down the path it's going down, it's going to become a very scary world to live in where they're monitoring everything you and I do, where we go, what we say. Just like on that clip on the video that China is now, if you don't put the right things on your social network, on your phones, on your Facebook, on all your social media, if you don't start doing the right things and saying the right things, they ban you from transportation. Well, that's coming to a society near you. If China's going to do it, eventually that will happen with what's going on. Don't think they're not monitoring what's happening on your Facebook and Google accounts and YouTubes and all that. That eventually one day might be used against us. So we're living in unprecedented times. And what I want you to see from the two witnesses, that we, we're going to take two sermons to do it, is to understand they're put in a situation in the most distressing period of time in biblical history, the tribulation. You can't get worse than that. It would be worse in that day than in Noah's day. It's really, really bad. It's worse in time in history. And they're thrust into that period of time. Now, the takeaway for us is we're not going to be in that time. We're going to be raptured before that. But look at the time period that you're living in and understand where you're at in biblical history. You and I are living at the end of the church age. You're in the what's called the Laodicean period. You're in the age where Paul predicted the great apostasy of the church. And we're seeing that. You were not privileged to live in, you know, the 1700s and the 1800s when America was going through its major spiritual revivals. And there were several of them in American history where just thousands and thousands of people were getting saved. You don't have the privilege of that. You're put in a period of time where very few people are getting saved. Very few Christians are following the Lord in their fellowship. And where the church growth movement, the seeker-friendly movement, the, the health and wealth prosperity gospel dominates the landscape of American Christianity. You and I are part of what's called the remnant, the Philadelphia church. And because of that, It's a very peculiar time to live in, very distressing time, very discouraging time, because you'll see a lot of your efforts of witnessing and trying to evangelize just fall short. And it's not your fault, it's the age that you live in. And you're going to see things you never would have imagined. I mean, think about this. Gay marriage, did you really think you were going to see that in your lifetime? You really think that the Supreme Court would legalize that in your lifetime or the transgender issue. And to the point that I got an email from Philip Lee this last week saying that California is ready to ban all therapeutic practices and counseling for people getting out of homosexuality and lesbianism. And he's very scared about that because that implies a destruction of his ministry. He won't be able to tell people to get out of that. Otherwise, he'll be fined by California and lose his license or whatnot. And most Christian counselors will do that. They'll lose their license because of this and get sued for having reparative therapy for people coming out of that lifestyle. They say that's not politically correct. You just never thought I'd see the day. It's crazy. Nonetheless, we're propelled in this kind of time period, and it's not by accident. It's not by accident. God is saying to you and I as the remnant of the church, I have put you here for a reason Just like I put Noah in the last days, and just like I'm going to put the two witnesses to witness to this world that's getting ready to go off a cliff. 
And if you're not going to tell them, who else will? And so I want to pick up a lot of that, what you're seeing with the witnesses, with us. We have a duty, and our duty is set before you. You have to know what your skill set is, what gifts that God has given you, what experiences God has given you, because he wants to use you even in the age of apostasy, believe it or not. So we'll take a lot of clues from the two witnesses. Let's start in Revelation 11, verse 3, and let me give you the background as you turn there. The background is we're taking a parenthesis, a pause, in the chronological order of the book of Revelation. And what it's doing, what John will do is he'll explain a lot of things chronology-wise, but then he'll stop and say, oh, by the way, this was going on at the same time. So what he's went through is, is the seal judgments being opened and the trumpet judgments being opened or being blown. And there's one more trumpet, but in the midst of the trumpet judgments, he says, during all this first half of the tribulation, let me tell you what was going on. And so we're introduced now to characters, two figures, prophetic figures called the two witnesses that he says this was going on concurrently with all these judgments happening. So in the book of Revelation, to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand there's multiple narratives stacked on each other that are happening at the same time. And so we're going to look at the employment, so to speak, the ministry, the task they were called to do for this first three and a half years of the tribulation. So let's start in and and start unpacking this a little bit. Verse 3 says, And I will give... And I know in your text it says power, or in some your translation says authority. It's actually nothing. And so in your Bible it should be italicized. It says, I will give to my two witnesses. So what is this blank in there? Some people put it power or authority. I think what it's trying to say, what John says, I will give blank to my two witnesses, is that God will give them what they need, whatever it is. He supplies their needs, and I think that's intentionally left blank in the original Greek because of that. And so you kind of fill in the blank. And he does give them power. He does give them authority. He does give them all kinds of supernatural abilities. But what's the point? And again, there's a takeaway for us. Whatever you're called to do in this age of apostasy, in the Laodicean period, he will give you what you need to the point. Now, here's what you're always going to say. You're always going to think it's never enough. I don't have enough. I need this. I need that. And what God is saying is, look in front of you. What do you have? That is enough. When he dealt with Moses, and Moses didn't think he had everything to go before Pharaoh, God said what to him? What is in your hand? And Moses says, staff. That's all I need. All I need is a staff. I'll take what you have, and we'll go and and free Israel from the clutches of Pharaoh. So what you see for what the two witnesses and for us, they are given exactly what they need. Do you know what the accusation among believers to Messiah are? You don't provide enough to do the work that you want us to do. That's the accusation. How do I know that's the accusation? Because it's in Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents. The one guy who goes and buries his talent accuses the Lord of not providing. He basically accuses the Lord, you lead, but you don't provide. And so then I went and buried my talent. That is sometimes the general mentality of believers is you don't provide enough, so I won't do. I won't serve. I won't do what I need to do. Whether that's money, resources, personnel, it doesn't matter. It's the same old story. But what we get from the two witnesses is this. Whatever that blank is in your life, he's given you enough. You have enough to do with the resources to do what he's called you to do. And that's what he's saying to the witnesses about them. And notice they're called the two witnesses. We'll talk about the my, but let's talk about the term witness. The term witness is a legal issue. So what, what you see in the book of Revelation, believe it or not, the book of Revelation is a legal document from God's perspective. If you read it from a legal document... It is a court put in session in Revelation 4 and 5, and the court proceedings are happening. And these two witnesses who had started at the beginning of the tribulation period are now going to function as God's witnesses to the earth, to planet earth. 
to the inhabitants of the earth. So a court is now in session, and that's why you see the legal issue of witnesses. Because under the law, you always have to have two witnesses. I'm talking about Jewish law. You always establish two or three witnesses. And so what God is doing is establishing his case in three areas. I want you to note the three areas and that God is bringing his case against humanity. The first case is against the Gentiles. The law he is using is the Noahic law that goes all the way back to the times of Noah. The Noahic covenant or the Noahic law was given to Noah and the inhabitants of the earth, Gentiles basically, that these are the laws I'm going to hold the Gentiles accountable for. It also includes the eternal laws of God, morality, and whatnot. The other case is against Israel. That's the second case. The case is made against Israel by the two witnesses, and they're witnessing not only to the Gentiles, but to the Jews as well. And then the third case is against Satan and his fallen angels. So the book of Revelation is concurrently making a case, a legal document, against all three groups, Gentiles, Jews, fallen angels, including Satan and his rebellion. Because this is going to be the final court case for all his creatures that he ever created. Now, this is important, and you'll see the typology of always using two witnesses. You remember the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Who accompanied the Lord as he went to go see what was going on there? And again, that's anthropomorphic language. He already knew what was happening, but he brought with him what? Two angels. And then the two angels go into Sodom and Gomorrah to act as a witness. It's not that God didn't know. He's establishing a legal matter, and he's doing it through angels. This is why in Daniel chapter 4, angels are called watchers. In Daniel chapter 4, there's a council, and there's councils of angels, obviously, and they're called watchers because the term implies that angels witness what's going on with people, what's going on in the world, so that when the legal proceedings happen, the angels can testify to what was going on. This is why you'll see in the book of Revelation that angels are assigned to churches. Every church has an angel assigned to it. That angel is to watch. He is watching what's going on. So, for instance, to put it in real-world language, there is an angel assigned to Rock Harbor. We don't know who he is, but he's assigned by God. He watches us. He watches what we're doing. He records what we're doing. Because on the day that we stand before our Lord, on the Bema seat, those angels witness for or against us based on what we did. And it's not for salvation, it's for rewards, obviously, but that's why angels are called watchers. They watch what's happening so they can testify in God's court. This is why you see the term witnesses being used. And notice they're Jewish witnesses, obviously. And they're from the Jewish origin, but they're my witnesses, God says. They're mine. These are the ones I'm establishing the record with. And that, again, goes to part of an application for us. The term, we have been bought with a price, indicates that we're his. We're his property. We're marked out for this, just like the two witnesses are. We are his. Well, it implies that he has a plan for us. Ownership implies a plan for us. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, let me look, let me show you Ephesians 2.10 real quick. I want you to notice something that has been pre-planned for you. It's not your salvation, but notice in the text what's been pre-planned for you. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is after, you know, salvation in in Ephesians 2.8 and 9 he talks about which God, what, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In what? The good works. This term, good works, is what has been planned for your life after you come to faith in Christ. God has a plan of how he wants to use you. And the way that plan gets found out is you look at your spiritual gifts, you look at what you can do as far as the abilities he's given you, and you figure out how to work the plan and to do those good works that he has destined you for to do. 
And again, notice it's a, not a destiny for salvation. It's a destiny of service. It's a call to service. So you have to sit there and wonder, what has God called me to do specifically in my life? He has called everybody to do this because that's his mark of ownership. Now, these two witnesses, what will they do during the tribulation period? They have a very high calling. They will prophesy, and you'll see this in just a bit. But what are they going to say? Their job is to witness to this lost world about the gross immorality of the breaking of God's laws, about the witness of Jesus Christ and his gospel and how to be saved. And they're going to warn about the Antichrist. They're going to warn about the false prophet. They're going to warn about the one world government, one world religion. That's their job. They're going to warn about the seven bold judgments. They're going to warn about the seven thunders. They're going to warn that Messiah is coming back, and he's coming back for judgment. Now, that's their message. That's what they've been given. And you know what the modern-day church would call that? Well, they just got a message of doom and gloom. They're not telling everybody they can have their best day on Friday. Well, yeah, I know, because it's the tribulation period and things have heated up. You think someone like Joel Olstein could manage the tribulation? I mean, seriously, man, think about that. You think most Casper Milk Toast Christians, even though we're going to be raptured, could handle what's the message of the two witnesses? They couldn't, because I can tell you that right now they can't handle that kind of message. They simply can't take That type of prophetic passage of warning, of someone warning about the imminent return of Christ with judgment. Oh, that's that's doom and gloom language, Brandon. That scares me to death. That's going to hurt our attendance. That's going to hurt our numbers. Don't do that. That scares people. That's their message. But I'm going to tell you this. Yours is very similar, and you're going to be accused of the same things. You're going to be accused of doom and gloom because you know why? You're in reality. And you're telling people how it is. You're doing it with grace. You're doing it with mercy. You're doing it with salt. But when you tell people what reality is, what's happening, it scares them because they're not in reality. But your job is to be like the two witnesses and get people into reality to understand the reality of Jesus Christ and what's happening in this world. But they don't like it. And I'm going to tell you what, you're going to get a pushback. And guess what? You're going to get the pushback from the world, but the biggest pushback you're going to get, other believers who don't believe it. That's where you're going to get the pushback. They're trying to have their best life now. They're trying to bring the kingdom on earth. They're trying to be involved in their social gospel parade, if you want to call it, where they're trying to tackle all these social issues and trying to bring the kingdom without the king. It's a joke. you got people like you saw in the video, like Beth Moore, saying her biggest thing of fighting for the faith is to fight Trump. Trump's done more for Christians than Obama or anyone else before them has ever done. He's done more for Israel. And I'm not a a big Trump supporter or anything. I'm just saying, my goodness, are you not in reality, Beth Moore? Do you not see that appointing 12 federal judges and a Supreme Court that's going to help our rights is not helping us? What are you, crazy? Yes. Yes. That's my point. Most of the evangelical world are out to lunch on these kinds of issues. And they're going down off the cliff on social gospel issues and not understanding what the real issues are. So if they really saw the two witnesses today, it would offend most of the church. They couldn't take their message. It's doom and gloom. But that's going to be told to you, and you just need to take it, accept it. It is what it is. Okay, so let's unpack a little bit more about them. It says, and they will prophesy... 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. That means it's 42 months or three and a half years. This is the first half of the tribulation, okay? So their ministry is only three and a half years, lunar years, okay? The Jewish calendar is 30 days. And they're clothed in sackcloth. Notice that's a garment that the Old Testament prophets and kings would wear anytime they're in a time of mourning, and any time that the message was pretty bad of what's happened. And so their ministry includes a sense of mourning. It is a doom and gloom, a mourning for the world being lost, a mourning for the majority of Israel that's going to be lost. And so there's that aspect. But notice that it's only for three and a half years. It's only for three and a half years. You would think, is that enough? According to God, that's enough time. Three and a half years to witness 
to the tribulation generation is enough time. Now, point of application before we move on, the time. You're given a certain amount of time in your life to do those works that he had already determined that you would do. Now, he's planned it out, but it doesn't mean you're going to fulfill it because you can cut your life short or you can cut your ministry short or you just simply not do it. But I want you to think, and I don't try to be morbid right here, but how many days you have left, how many days I have left. Because it's making a point, 1,260 days, that's not a lot of time. How much time do you think you have? The rapture could happen at any point in time, no doubt about that. It could happen right now, it could happen tonight, and we'd all be gone. And everything you have done up to this point is what's going to be counted for reward. But believe it or not, if you take your days and how old you are, and to the average life expectancy, which is 76 years and about five or six months, that's about average of what people live. Have you ever counted your days? Believe it or not, there's a morbid clock or watch you can get, and you type in your age, and it tells you how many, has, how many days that you have left. It's pretty morbid. I don't mean to scare you. I don't mean to put you in depression. But let me go through that just a second. If you're 19 years old or anywhere close to 19, wouldn't it be great to be 19? You have 19,000 days left. Probably not even thinking about it, right? If you jump to 35 years old, you have about 15,000 days left if you live to be average of 76. If you're 45, which I'm going to be this year, yikes, you have 12,000 days left. If you jump to 55, you jump down to 7,665 days left. Now it starts getting a little scary. If you're 65, you have 4,000 days left. If you're 70, you have 2,190 days left. I'm not going to go any further than that (laughs) because that gets too scary. You're like, oh, man, when you put it that way, Brandon, that frightens me. Well, it should because we're not given a lot. They're given only three and a half years to accomplish their ministry. And by the way, when you research this, you spend a third of your life sleeping. So subtract more. And you're like, oh, man, that's that's even worse. That makes me more depressed because I'm going to spend a third of my life sleeping. Yikes. And eating and all this other stuff. And so I don't recommend buying a death clock. Believe it or not, they sell a death clock, and you can buy them in Europe, and these Europeans are all into that stuff. And it's like, no way I'm not going to have a death clock. But what's the point? He's going to give you and I a set number of days to accomplish our mission in life. And I pray and hope that you and I will do everything we can to fulfill every day. Most people check out after a while. They get tired. They go into retirement or whatnot, and they say, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Don't ever retire. You can retire from work, absolutely, but don't ever retire from Jesus. Don't ever retire from him. Don't ever retire from serving him. In fact, that's when the best time you can serve him, when you're freed up from employment and you can serve him all the, all the time. That's, that's fantastic. Time is a big issue. We'll come back to that at the end. But let's continue on with these individuals because and now it starts getting a little tricky. Verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Wow, well, that doesn't help me to understand who they are. Who are they? Well, that right there is a reference to Zechariah 4. And John assumes that you and I know that passage and know the context of chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6 of Zechariah. So let's turn to Zechariah and read the text. Because what John is saying is these two guys or what Zechariah prophesies. Now, the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me. This is in Zechariah, the Old Testament. As a man who wakened out of his sleep, and he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I am looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. A lampstand probably should be, be translated menorah. It's Jewish. 
a menorah. You know the candelabra, a menorah, you get right in front of the Knesset, they have a giant candelabra, and Hanukkah has the candelabra. It's a Jewish candle that was in the temple, and it has seven wicks on it, one in the middle and three on the outside. You've probably seen a menorah. That's what he's talking about. So I see a menorah, a solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes, two to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other one at its left. So the image that Zechariah gives, he says, and this is what John's drawing off. There's the two olive trees on the side. There's the menorah. It has seven lampstands, and it's being fed by this funnel, by a branch. Branch is going into it, and obviously it's, what would light a menorah is olive oil. A certain type of olive oil, you could light it, and that's what they would light the menorah with. And the priests in Levitical times had to keep putting oil in the lamp. That's what Hanukkah is about, that the oil lasted like eight days. It was a miraculous event that happened at Hanukkah. That's why they celebrate Hanukkah, because the oil went for that long, and it should have ran out. But what this passage is saying is the branches are feeding into the menorah, And the gravity is pulling the oil down, and it's a constant supply of oil, a stream of oil, into the lamp that's lit and stays lit because of this constant stream of oil that's coming from the branches going into it. Okay? Continue to read. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. He answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now that's, I'll talk about Zerubbabel in just a second. Notice the phrase, and you've seen this phrase before, right? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now you've seen that quoted on coffee mugs and you've seen that on people's pictures in their home and people typically don't know the context of that phrase and what it's applying to, but it applies to the two witnesses and it applies to something very specific. Okay, let's unpack this so we understand what the nature of the two witnesses and their role is and so we can maybe identify who they are. Let's go back to the picture. So this is what they see in the vision, what Zechariah sees in the vision. Okay, Let's now put this in perspective so we can understand it. Zechariah is what's called a post-exilic prophet, which means he is a prophet after the Babylonian exile. He writes after the exile. And there's only three post-exilic prophets before the Gospels, okay, before the Gospel starts. So there's an intertestament period, a long period of time, several hundreds of years. I think there's 400 years there. And the last prophets were the post-exilic prophets, okay? And what they're talking about many times is they're the ones talking about the rebuilding of the temple in Ezra and Nehemiah's day. So as they were banished out of Israel, when they came back, you remember the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were rebuilding the walls, rebuilding the temple, which we call as the second temple or Zerubbabel's temple, which eventually morphed into what's called Herod's temple in Jesus' day. So Israel comes back after the exile, and the big thing for them is to rebuild their temple, the second temple. Okay, Solomon's temple has been desecrated. Now a new temple we, we call Zerubbabel's temple or Herod's temple. So then when we look back to this, okay, it's a post-exilic prophet, What it's saying is this. So let's understand the historical content before we move to the prophetic content. Historically, the menorah always represents Israel, the nation of Israel. Anytime you see a menorah in Scripture, it's a representation of the light of Israel. And Israel was supposed to be a light unto who? The Gentiles, right? The whole entire world. They're supposed to be a priestly nation to give the revelation. Light represents the revelation of God being given out to the world. And they were supposed to do the work of evangelism and bringing everyone to Yahweh. That's what their role was and will be in the future. So the menorah represents Israel. And then the lights, obviously the the, the menorah is the light of revelation that they give. And represents that once they're going to be restored... And the symbol of that restoration is the temple. 
Because the menorah, which represents Israel, is associated to what place? The temple. So, we understand that. Now, understand, help me understand the branches and help me understand the flow of oil. Well, if you read Zechariah, the branch is capital branch. It's a reference to the Messiah, the branch. And then the oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. Notice that the branches are what feeds into Israel, Messiah, and from Messiah comes an endless stream of what? Oil, representing the Holy Spirit. It implies Israel's restoration by the Messiah. Okay? So historically what happens, you have a near and far fulfillment. Now hang with me on this. In prophecy, sometimes you'll see a near fulfillment, and then you'll see a projection of a far fulfillment that actually is the antitype. So like the abomination of desolation, Antiochus Epiphanes did that, and then in the future, Antichrist will do it, right? Okay, so in this case, you have a near and a far fulfillment. What's a near fulfillment? The two witnesses during that day were Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest. Not Joshua in the land of Canaan, but Joshua is another Joshua who was the high priest. Joshua represented the priestly class and the religious area of Israel, and Zerubbabel was the governor of Israel. And that's why it's called Zerubbabel's temple, temple because they rebuilt it. So you have a king-priest situation going on in Israel, restoring the temple, historically. But Zechariah went beyond their day and said, it's more than just them, it's this branch. And this branch will have both offices of king and priest. And this branch is going to fuel Israel one more time and refuel their temple to be a light unto the Gentiles. What does that mean prophetically? It means that two more witnesses will be used, not just Zerubbabel or Joshua, but two unnamed witnesses will be used in the future to usher in the branch who is now going to restore Israel to be a light to the Gentiles, restore their temple, and start what we call the millennial reign of Messiah, or the Messianic age, where the temple is rebuilt and the, cons- the continual stream of, of oil, which represents the Holy Spirit now involved in Israel's life, will permeate all through the kingdom age. I know that seems a little complicated, but that's what it's trying to say. So when we jump back into the book of Revelation, this is the fulfillment of this. This is the antitype of this. And these two witnesses are going to usher in the branch. Israel won't one day be saved. Okay, what does this mean for the temple? Like we studied before last week, the temple that's currently getting ready to get built, the third temple, is not sanctioned by God. He didn't order them to do it. It'll be the temple the Antichrist desecrates. In Zechariah chapter 6, it says the third real temple will be built by Messiah. So when Jesus comes back, he builds what's called the millennial temple or the messianic temple, which you can see in Ezekiel 40 through 48. Okay. But that doesn't help me, Brandon. I still don't know who they are. That just told me their function. I get it. They're going to usher in the branch who's going to cause a revival in Israel and all Israel will be saved. I get that. Okay. But who are they? Well, there's a lot of conjecture. There's a lot of conjecture about this. Just go out there with me just a little bit because sometimes we can't unpack everything. It is somewhat a mystery of who these two individuals are. And But there's theories and they're good theories. And I think I still haven't landed on one side or the other. I think there's several good theories out there. The first theory. The first theory is one of them is Elijah. And I get that because Malachi 4 predicts that Elijah does come back. Now, there's still argument that even though Elijah comes back, it doesn't necessarily make him one of the two witnesses, but it possibly could be. It makes sense. If he's on the ground again, it's possible that one of the two witnesses is Elijah. That's great. If you want to believe that, that's great. I think that's an acceptable view. 
Other theories are the other witness is Moses. And the reason they do that is they argue, well, Moses and Elijah were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, and the disciples saw a preview of the second coming with the transformation. And guess who was accompanying Jesus? Moses and Elijah. And so that has led some people to think it's Elijah and Moses. They represent the law and the prophets. And I get that. I totally, I, I'm, I'm tracking with that. Both had unusual types of exits from life. Moses was purposely buried by God and hidden. His body was hidden. Especially in the, the, the valley that Moses was hid, hidden in, they used to consider that valley the entrance into hell. And so Moses was buried in that valley by God, and God did not let anyone know. Satan knew where he was at, and Michael had to fight over the body of Moses, if you recall that in Jude. So there's something very peculiar about Moses' burial. Anyway, Elijah had a similar type of experience, taken up into heaven, and... Then the other theory then is, well, maybe it's not Elijah, it's Enoch. Or it's Enoch and Moses, or it's Elijah and Enoch. Because Enoch was translated, he was virtually raptured in the Old Testament. The thing about Enoch and Elijah, in their theory, they have a strong point, that Enoch was taken in the middle of the antediluvian era, and Elijah was taken in the middle of Israel's era. They are both were taken in the middle of those eras. Again, all of them have good points, and then all of them have cons. And the other argument is that, no, these are neither Elijah or Moses or Enoch. These are two future Jewish prophets. And they come in the spirit and power of Moses and Elijah. Okay, and that's acceptable as well. And honestly, we could spend entire sermons trying to unpack who it is. But I would say those are the acceptable ones. It's Moses or Elijah, or Moses and Enoch, it, or it's two Jewish witnesses. I think that's all good argumentation, and that's, that's within the pale of orthodoxy. But you must say this. It is people. It's human beings. Do not let anyone tell you, oh, that's the Old and New Testament, or that's the church. No, 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 no. How does a church die? so to speak, because they're, they're killed by the Antichrist. These are people that die. And so a lot of people say, well, well how is Moses and Elijah going to die and are Enoch going to die? Well, has it been impossible that people have died twice? No. Plenty of people in the Old Testament died twice. Jonah was one of them. People that Jesus raised back from the dead eventually died. They weren't resurrected unto glory. They were resurrected even like Lazarus was brought back from the dead, but he died again, right? Jairus' daughter, she was resurrected back to life, but she died a second death. So it's not unusual for people in the Old Testament to die twice. It's very possible. So if he did bring back Moses, and I do believe he will bring Elijah, I do believe that, it's not impossible or out of the realm for them to die twice. I don't have a problem with that theologically. That's, that precedent's already been set. So that's acceptable. So I'll let you wrestle with that because that takes a lot of investigation. There's pros and cons, but they are human. You've got to at least settle on that. They are human beings. And nonetheless, let's continue on and watch what happens because they're given supernatural abilities. It's pretty amazing. Verse 5, and if anyone wants to harm them, because many will, by the way, fire proceeds from their mouth. And devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. That's unprecedented. We have never seen this in biblical history. Now, we've seen fire come down out of heaven and incinerate people. We've definitely seen that. Fire came down out of heaven and incinerated Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, prophets of Baal and all that. We saw the fire consume the, the altar. We saw that. We have never seen a prophet have the ability in their mouth to have the fire of heaven come out of their mouth in what they're doing, and people especially trying to attack them. Do you see how this has to be a person? It can't be the Old and New Testament. How does someone attack that? Okay, so the whole point here is this. This is a new twist, and they have the ability to incinerate people who attack them. Wow. Wow. What is the symbolic nature of that? Because it's real fire coming out of their mouth. 
But what's the symbol? Fire is always a symbol of judgment, but fire is a symbol also of hell. These people who are trying to attack them are going to get their first taste of hell when they try to attack them, and it's through fire coming out of their mouth. Fire is always a symbol of judgment, but it represents the flames of the lake of fire. And so these people who are trying to attack them, they meet their doom right away. It is pretty scary. The other thing they have the ability in verse 6, if you jump to verse 6, these have the power also to shut up heaven. The idea is the atmosphere. So that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood. And so you see the fire and you see the blood, and that's why a lot of people theorize it's Moses and it's Elijah, because Elijah shut off the rain for Israel for three and a half years, and that's the same number, and Moses turned the water into blood, and that's where the symbolic nature of it is pointing to, and I get that. And, and, and obviously, turning off the water in the tribulation is going to be a big problem, because most of the water is now turning to blood so far. There's nothing to drink. And then they cause a drought? Do you understand how the world will hate them? Every time they say something, the people are going to get in a fever pitch trying to kill them. Just kind of how they are today. They get mad at you and I for just speaking the truth, and it's like they want to fight you. They want to beat you up. They want to kill you. Yeah, that's how it will be with them. But they'll be protected by God's power. But what's in the symbolism? What is Israel supposed to pick up from this? Ah, you're on to something. God is giving his calling card to Israel. What do you mean? He's doing similar things that he did with Israel's history with Moses and Elijah to say, I'm here, I'm back here with you. He is speaking Israel's language, their love language, so to speak. What do you mean? Man, if you ever walk into a synagogue and you listen to Moses is venerated, Elijah is venerated, man. And these guys are the big shots, David and all those guys. These are the, the venerations of the Jews. But when these two prophets, whoever they are, are doing similar things to Moses, what do you think they're going to think? That's Yahweh's calling card. Wait a second. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is working for us. And look what he's doing. It's the calling card of God. And now with a little twist, but he's ramping it up with a little twist, but that's what God is doing. He's saying, it's me. I have not abandoned you. I'm with you, Israel, and you need to come to faith in me. And so all of this is to spurn and start a revival in Israel. Now, they can do it as often. One more passage I'll show you. And it says they can do it as often as they want to. And to strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. See that term, as they desire. They have full reign of when they can do this. If they, they want to do it, they issue it. Anytime. And so they've been given a big privilege in order to do this and to strike the earth with this. So all that to say is God has given them a great responsibility in the worst period of human history. Now let's bring this back to you and I because we will continue this next week. You and I have been given an incredible ministry in the worst time of church history. Notice what I said. Not human history, church history. There has never been a time worse theologically I'm not talking persecution-wise. Even though persecution is an all-time high, there's never been a time more theologically incorrect than we have ever seen than today, and it will continue to get worse. And you and I are putting them smack dab in the middle of that time period. For what? To put on our sackcloth in ashes and tell a lost world, if you continue in this path, you are going to go over the cliff. Because what's the cliff that's coming? For them, it's the second coming. What's the cliff that's coming? Well, the rapture is going to happen, and everyone that's not a believer who were faking it are going to be left behind for the Antichrist, will be left behind for the whore of Babylon. And if they do get saved after that, they're going to probably lose their heads. They'll be martyred because of that. And we don't want people to, to miss out on this, to escape this period of time. But let me return back to the issue of time. 
1,260 days doesn't seem like a lot, but it accomplishes a lot, a, a big thing going on in Israel. It starts their revival. Just three and a half years starts Israel's revival. We'll talk more about that next week. With the time you and I have remaining, we talked about with the days left, how are you using that time? Are you using it on yourself? Or are you using it to serve the Lord? Let me give him an example of a thing I just couldn't believe when I read. The lady was doing a scratcher playing the lottery. She went into like a 7-Eleven, scratched off a, a lottery ticket, won several million dollars off a scratcher. And you think, wow, okay, her life has really changed, and she's going to do all these wonderful things and be into philanthropy. Who knows? I don't know. She's going to change her life. She won all this money, and the reporter asked her, and she was out of South Carolina, in Piedmont, South Carolina, and they said, what are you going to do now that you've won all these millions of dollars? She says, I'm going to fulfill my dream. And they go, what is your dream? I've always wanted to work at Walmart. What? I want to be a greeter at Walmart, she said. Welcome to Walmart. Here's a millionaire who has millions of dollars winning the lottery, and her dream was, I got to be at Walmart, man. And she went to work at Walmart. Can you believe that? I don't know about you, but I don't think I would spend my time if I won that. Not that I would be playing the lottery, but... I don't think I would want to go work at Walmart if I had all the free time in the world. If God gave me a bunch of free time, I would be doing exactly what I'm doing now. I would be ministering, doing something on the ministry level. And I pray you would do the same. I I hope none of you would start doing that. But the fact is, you count your days and you start realizing, oh my goodness, they're numbered. Now let me give you a serious story and we'll finish on this because... Time is important. I'm constantly reminded as a pastor, we don't have much time. And even with people's lives, and I've sometimes neglected it. And I'll tell you an instance when I neglected it. I got a call, and somebody in our church's friend was in the hospital. The woman was in the hospital. And anytime I, I don't know the situation, I go in there with the expectation I'm going to give the gospel because you just don't know. You don't know what's going to go on. And I heard the woman was in pretty bad shape. She had an aneurysm building, I guess. It hadn't busted, but it was there, and they needed to go in there and do surgery, but there was a certain percentage of chance that the lady's not going to make it through surgery because the aneurysm could bust while they're doing it. But if she continues to live, it's going to bust anyway. So they had to do something. They're not believers, by the way, and I heard they weren't believers. So I said, okay, uh, um, I'll go visit her. So I immediately go to the hospital, and you walk in there in your intensive care unit, and there's family members there and nurses, and it's just... Every time you try to get and share the gospel, there's always hindrances. There's always someone fooling around. There's always a dog barking, a stupid phone ringing. Or it's always like, why is that? And I'm like, do you guys know you're being used by Satan right now? But anyway, I go in there, and a lot of commotion going on. Their family's there, and, and she's kind of, uh, she's awake, but she can't respond. And I go in there, and I pray with her, but I didn't get a chance to share the gospel with her because there was, I just, there was all kinds of stuff going on, and I'm like, ah, it's not a good time, man. And I, it was my mistake. I, I should have just pushed through it, and I didn't. And I left, and I said, doggone it, man. And I was kicking myself. I go, she could die through this operation. And I, man, if she dies, I might have been the last person to share the gospel with her. I felt real bad because time is of the essence at that point. Anyway, I left, and she went and had surgery, and it didn't go well. And you know, I was talking to the husband, and he's like, yeah, I don't know if she's ever going to come out of it. And she, she almost like went into a coma-type situation. I go, oh, man. I mean, she, I go, she's going to die. And I go, man, I didn't get a chance to witness to her. And, that man, that's on me. That's on me. I should have been more sensitive with the time. So I confess that, that I wasted that time. And I, I, I confessed that to the Lord, and I said, I, I won't do that next time. So anyway, I said, Lord, can you give me another chance? If you're going to take a reviver for a little bit so I can talk to her, just give me another chance. Just like Jonah, kind of, you know, give me another second chance. So a few weeks went on. She's still in this coma state, and I'm like, oh, man. So finally, I get a call, and it's the husband. And he goes, hey, can you come down and pray with her? She's awake. 
and uh, we'd like you to come pray with her. And I said, okay, I'm not, I got it, I'm not missing this one. So I went back, and she was awake, and she was extremely alert. I've seen these situations before. Before they die, they, they get in, into a situation where they're extremely alert and aware. And I got in there, and she couldn't speak, and they had done all the surgery, and it was, it was no good. It, you know, she had her head all wrapped up. She was awake, alert, but couldn't speak. And I just went right for it. I wouldn't wait. And I said, I'm glad you're awake because I wanted to tell you something before you went into surgery. Now God's given me the ability to tell you right now, and I'm going to tell you. And I just went right into the gospel. And, and she, I go, if you can't respond, just squeeze my hand if you want to do this. I said, I think God's trying to tell you you need, you need to accept Jesus because she hadn't. So she accepted the Lord, and she, she did it not by making a sound, but she could squeeze my hand. That's all she could do. And she smiled, and she knew she had accepted Christ. And I left her that day, and then eventually she passed away. But I know she went to heaven because at the very end, God had given her a second chance through all that aneurysm stuff to get saved before he took her into eternity. And that's just one example of time. God gave her more grace extended her life perhaps a couple more days to get the message of salvation and she got saved but on my end i don't want you to be like me don't miss opportunities i'm kicking myself for that i almost lost that opportunity because time is of the essence 1260 days doesn't seem like a lot but you think about in that hospital situation one day meant everything One day. That's why in Scripture it says today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Don't kick the can down the road. And as far as us believers, don't kick the can down the road saying, well, I'll serve him when I'm less busy. I'll serve him when it's convenient for me. I'll serve him when I get my affairs in order. I'll serve him when my kids get grown. I'll serve him when I'm retired. No, no, no. You may not have that. Serve him today. Today. 